then you start saying something big is going on here. And you start pushing. I mean, if we hadn't run into the roadblocks, we might have stopped with that first story. But when you start running it everywhere, people covering up, the government not doing anything, nobody seeming to care where all these billions of dollars went or cared to try to get them back, that's when you start looking, for, you know, you know you've got a big story. And I, I told the editor, who was Alice Mayhew, who was Bob Woodward's editor, a very famous editor, you know, that the book needed to go before the election, we needed to get going. And she said she wasn't going to do it. They were not going to do the book before the election. And I said, why not? You know, all this stuff about Bush, the American public needs to know. And she said, quote, George Bush is going to win anyway. His writings on the mob, the CIA, and George Bush have been ignored by the irregular media and the Congress, subjected to censorship in Houston. But now Pete Bruton talks freely on alternative views. Welcome to the second part of our Alternative Views interview with author Pete Bruton. Pete has just published a book called The Mafia, CIA, and George Bush. And in our last program, we told how Pete analyzed the connection between the CIA and the SNL fraud and how he discovered that George Bush and his family, unsavory folks connected to the CIA and the Mafia, as well as associates of Texas big shots such as Senator Lloyd Benson and Houston power broker Walter Mischer were all involved in the SNL fraud, which was one of the greatest U.S. financial catastrophes and crimes in our history. Today, however, we're going to talk about how Pete came to break this story, about his experiences as a Houston Post reporter in which he discovered the connections between the SNL and the CIA scandal, how he decided to write a book, his experiences with Simon & Schuster, and how he finally got his book published, and what the response of the book by the media has been. You've been tracking this SNL thing for a long time. What is the magnitude of the scandal? Well, we, we all hear about it. it's going to cost uh, taxpayers about $500 billion. Uh, that includes a little over $200 billion of actual losses that the SNLs have incurred that fail, that, that the taxpayers are going to have to pay back. But when you throw in interest and carrying costs, you get over $500 billion in direct costs. But the other costs are almost as bad. What these fraudulent SNLs did was create an artificial real estate bubble where they inflated real estate values artificially uh, very much and then the bu bubble burst. And that sort of spread out, that, the, the fallout from that spread to the banks and insurance companies and any other financial institutions that were lending on, on real estate. And so one of the reasons the banks are in big trouble now is their real estate portfolio. And the, the larger a, a, such a portfolio a bank has, the more trouble it's in. So uh, the, the effects spread out through the economy in, in, in the real estate value. So it's not just $500 billion, which is an incredible hit, but also the indirect real estate effects. I guess also you could crank into this the amount of money that was skimmed and uh, stolen by all these people was money which did not go into productive resources so that we're losing out from that aspect also. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, when you think about... Uh, somebody has estimated that the actual cost when, when we start paying back to, ta to taxpayers is going to be $25 billion a year 
from now on, forever. Think about what, $25 billion every year, what we could have used for that. And then when you think about it, the money was basically looted and stolen, and that Congress and the Justice Department are not trying to get it back. And that's one of the keys to all this, is tracing the money and also trying to recover it. Uh, there's been none of that. I mean, Congress doesn't want to do it because they're involved up to their eyeballs. When you start tracing this money, like you did with the Keating Five, you find it comes in, some of it comes back to their own campaign, tr you know, chess. And uh, the Justice Department, which is controlled by the, the President, of course, has not tried to track the money. They're interested in just getting uh, the front men and the cutouts and the middle men to cop guilty pleas and, and go to jail maybe for a year or two and then go on to the next one. So they rack up all these convictions, but they don't try to really figure out what happened and where the money went and who benefited. Pete, one of the reasons why the government has not done any real prosecution or investigation of this scandal is because they've been involved in it, going all the way to the top up to George uh, Bush. We didn't really get into last time the complicity of George Bush's son, Neil, in a SNL scandal, the Silverado case. Perhaps we can go into that as an illustration of how the SNL scandal worked and the complicity of top establishment officials in this crisis. Sure. We all know that Neil was a director of Silverado Savings in Denver, Colorado, and that uh, when he was on the board of directors, he was being supported financially by a couple of Dis Denver businessmen named Ken Good and Bill Walters. At the same time, Walters and Good were borrowing huge amounts of money from Silverado. And in fact, Neil got his hand slapped in administrative action for approving loans to his business associate, Bill Walters. Um, what we don't know, what hasn't come out really before, are the connections between not only Good and Walters, uh, but to other Silverado borrowers, to mafia people and to the CIA. And we find that if you look at, say, Bill Walters, Bill Walters was the largest borrower at Silverado Savings. Uh, he signed on about $130 million of loans. In addition, uh, he sold property to Silverado of about $90 million. Uh, Walters was a Denver architect. Walters and his partners, including a guy named Richard Ross Miller, were involved in the Texas Renabank scandal back in the mid-'70s with Herman K. Beebe. I mean, Beebe was in, and Ben Barnes were involved in, in deals with these people, and Beebe specifically had transferred about a million dollars to Richard Ross Miller, Bill, Bill Walters' partner. And they had all owned a bank in Marshall, Texas that was involved in the Texas Rent-A-Bank scandal. And uh, we find that Walters was also apparently and had been accused of transferring some of his ill-gotten gains to a trust on the Isle of Jersey that was being uh, funneled, drug money was being laundered through it by people in Miami, and SNL money from uh, people like Robert Corson, and the CIA agent was going also going through this trust fund. Uh, Ken Good, who borrowed over $40 million from Silverado and was Neil Bush's sugar daddy for several years, uh, had also borrowed money from Western Savings in Dallas. It was part of the Herman K. Beebe circle. Um, the biggest company that actually dealt with Silverado was MDC Holdings, it was, whose chief executive is Larry Mizell. Uh, Mizell was a big Republican donor. Uh, he held fundraisers that George Bush went to. Uh, and Mizell had established trust funds by, done by a Chicago law firm uh, whose partner was Burton Cantor. Burton Cantor was one of the founding uh, fathers of Castle Bank and Trust, the uh, bank in the Bahamas that the Mafia and the CIA were using. Uh, he was involved with uh, CIA projects, uh, I mean, Mafia projects in California and, and other Mafia figures. Um, and here we have his trust, you know, Larry Mizell's trust fund being set up by Burton Cantor's law firm. And Burton Cantor was also a close associate of Lawrence Freeman, the Miami lawyer who had worked for Paul Hellowell, the CIA founding father, and worked for the mafia and had been involved in the big Florida land deal that uh, Robert Corson's SNL was funding. So we find this circle, you start pulling on this thread, you look at the people involved in Silverado and you're back 
with the mafia and the CIA. Now, how did Neil Bush get involved in all of this? What was his initial connection with uh, Silverado? Well, and what did he get out of it? Neil Bush uh, had gone to Denver after getting out of, of, of college and was a landman for Amico, I believe, which meant he went and tried to secure leases so they could drill on the land. And then uh, Bill Walters uh, and Ken Good set him up in his own company. Okay, they were both big Republican donors. Uh, Ken Good went to the inauguration party with Neil Bush in Houston in 1988 when Bush won. Uh, Bush visited Bill Walters' home in the 1984 campaign. Bill Walters tore up all his brown grass and laid new green grass on his lawn just for George Bush's visit. Okay, they were pumping money into Neil Bush's company that was drilling dry holes in Wyoming was not making any money. He was being, basically, his salary was being paid by these people. And his company got a big line of credit at Bill Walters Bank. So they were supporting him. Ken Good put, put him on the board of directors of a Florida company he had and was paying him over $100,000 a year in director's fees. Oh I mean, outrageous. Uh, $12,000 I mean, $12, a month was going uh, to Neil Bush uh, for just serving on Ken Good's board. They were basically keeping him going. Uh, and Protect, he bought Protection money, it sounds like. Well, you know, it's almost somebody made the analogy that Neil Bush was sort of like the driver of the getaway car. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the cops weren't going to shoot at the president's son. And so far, all we've had is one indictment. The, uh, the CEO, uh, Michael Wise, is the only indictment so far on Silverado savings. Now, what about Neil Bush and Silverado? What role did he play in particular? Well, he was a, particular? a director, and in a, he approved loans. Uh, to his buddy Bill Walters. He also approved loans uh, to the second largest borrower at Silverado was a Houston con man named E. Trine Starnes. Uh, Starnes borrowed $77.5 million from Silverado six months after he donated $30,000 to the Contras and went and had a meeting with Ronald Reagan and Oliver North. Uh, and he also borrowed over $25 million from Continental Savings in Houston that was supported by Mafia Money from Herman K. Beebe. And uh, Starnes was also involved with John Riddle, the guy who was uh, transshipping arms to the Middle East, and had, had gotten support from uh, Allied Bank, Walter Mischer's bank. And he turns out to be the second largest borrower at Silverado Savings. Uh, so Neil Bush was, was basically just sitting on the board almost like a figurehead, but approving these loans and, uh, you know, helping his buddies out. And, and getting paid also for it as a director. Right. Mm -hmm. That's correct. No, though not nearly as much as he got from, from being a director on Ken Good's company. Let's talk about how you got this incredible story. Now, your book is, to me, a masterpiece in the sense that everything is so complex. There's so many interconnections and so many layers of activity, and yet you were able to lay it out uh, so that it uh, it makes sense and you can follow it. Uh, my first question is, how did you get all this voluminous material and keep track of it? Well, I've been working on it for over five years. I mean, anybody can <laughs> probably collect that much information in five years. You know, you, you, I've got three, four drawer file cabinets full of documents that uh, that support all this information, but. I mean, you just take one step at a time. And, and when I first started on the SNL story in the spring of 87, and looking at one deal at Mainland Savings in Houston, the, when it failed in 86, was the largest failure in the country. And you start running into roadblocks and people not talking and can't get documents and nobody's being prosecuted and the money isn't being tracked and nobody's trying to get the money back. Then you start saying something big is going on here. And you start pushing. I mean, if we hadn't run into the roadblocks, we might have stopped with that first story. But when you start running it everywhere, people covering up, the government not doing anything, nobody seeming to care where all these billions of dollars went or cared to try to get them back, that's when you start looking, for, you know, you know you've got a big story. And so you just keep going. I mean, and everywhere I looked, I found something. It was like, I mean, being in the oil business, everywhere you, you, you dig a hole, you hit oil. I mean, every rock you turn over, something scurries out from under it. And uh, it, it's just a, it was a wonderful story in that sense. Well, you even have, I mean, you, you, divorce decrees were significant. Things yes. like this. Yeah, well, you know, the, the SNLs do not, 
the documents at the SNLs are not public. The loan documents, where the money went, the closing documents, the public can't get them. Reporters cannot get them. We cannot track the money. We don't have subpoena power. So the things you rely on are lawsuits and deed records, basically. And so uh, the divorce decrees are in, divorce lawsuits are very, they have a lot of good information in them. Pete, let's um, go into the history of how you actually came to uh, write this book, starting with your first stories with the Houston Post. In the spring of 86, I was working on stories involving charitable foundations and hospitals that were not doing enough services for the poor. And um, a business reporter at the Post named Greg C. got an anonymous call from a guy that we had, we dealt with for over two years. And we, his nickname was DT, which was, you know, our short for Deep Throat. And uh, <laughs> for a long time, we didn't even know who, who he was. Well, this guy calls up Greg and tells him that he should start investigating mainland savings, and there it deals with a man named Howard Pulver. So Greg starts doing this. And we eventually found out that Pulver and his partners had over 300 companies, and they were doing deals with mainland all over Houston. And Greg just found himself drowning in a sea of records. There were thousands and thousands of pages of records in the, the, the real property records of Harris County on these deals with mainland. So I was asked just to come help him sort out the records. And we, we did that, and then we went and interviewed Raymond Hill the chief executive officer of Mainland Savings. And Hill's attitude uh, was, was the most arrogant that I've ever encountered in, in my career as a reporter. And, and basically, he accused us at one point of, of stumbling in the same direction as the FBI. And I knew I had a big story, just the way he was acting like we can't touch him. And, and uh, sort of really thumbing his nose at us that I knew that there was a big story there, and, and we immediately ran into the mafia. Uh, there was a, when we were trying to track the deal with, with Howard Pulver, who lived in Kings Point, Long Island, outside New York, and his partners were all from New York City. They came down and took close to $100 million out of mainland savings, left them with, with promissory notes that were worth, you know, probably less than $10 million. Uh, a huge ripoff and contributed greatly to the failure of mainland savings. Um, at the same time he was doing this, uh, Mario Renda was brokering money into mainland. In fact, there was an indictment in Brooklyn by the Organized Crime Strike Force talking about the money Mario Renda was skimming off of his uh, deposits uh, and placing in various SNLs, and one of them was mainland. Uh, so we knew we had something bigger. We went up to New York City and we found uh, Renda's partner in this was a guy named Martin Schwimmer, who was also laundering money for the Lucchese Mafia family. Okay, when we went to talk to, to Howard Pulver and to Martin Schwimmer, we found they lived across the street from each other in Kings Point, New York, which is a very wealthy uh, suburban enclave on the North Shore of Long Island, very exclusive. And so here we had Schwimmer pumping maybe a hundred million dollars in deposits into mainland and the guy who lives across the street from him taking about a hundred million dollars out the back door <laughs> and so we knew we had something very big then and then when we found we started tracking Renda and then we heard about Herman K. Beebe the Louisiana Mafia associate who was involved in all the failed Texas SNLs we started tracking Beebe and then we find Beebe and Renda together at so many different places. I mean, here's a, as a New York Mafia associate and a Louisiana Mafia associate, both at the same places, the same times, across the country. So, we, you know, we knew that there was a big, big story here. Were you shocked or surprised to see that the Mafia was active in looting these SNL banks in Texas? Or had you studied organized crime before? Just on a couple of occasions we'd run into it. I mean, the, the myth is there's no organized crime in Texas. And it's, uh, it's, it's wrong. It's just flat wrong. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of small indigenous mafia families in Texas, but no big mafia family. But it, Texas is basically under the aegis of the Louisiana, the Carlos Marcello mafia family. And, and there's, there's a lots of mafia activity in, in Texas. I mean, of course, anytime you have, you know, 
people like the oil, Texas oil men that naturally like to gamble. I mean, the way the mafia gets their their foot in the door and their fingers into a community, a new community, is through gambling. I mean, that's the way to do it. And, and of course, oil men naturally love anybody who likes to gamble has got all that money. I mean, they're going to have to, if you bet big on anything illegally, you're dealing with the mafia, probably whether you know it or not. And if you don't pay up, you're going to find out in a hurry. There's a price to <laughs> pay. Yeah, and, and we found that if you look at all the, uh, the congressional crime uh, committees and, and their studying of Carlos Marcello, you find in one case where he was talking to a Houston oil man named uh, Josie in one case. And, and we find uh, John Meekham Jr., uh, the Houston oil man, uh, dealing with the Marcellos. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's, you find them in Texas and dealing with a lot of the big wheeler dealers and, and power brokers. Uh, the story was, uh, this, uh, was running in the Houston Post, but I've noticed in studying uh, local power structures in the media that the, usually the local uh, media don't take on or expose any of the activities of local power brokers. But you were writing about Misher. Well, I was writing about him, but none of the stories on Misha were running. Okay. All the um, paper censored. Eh? Yeah. Um, when we had done, oh, we spent two years working on the Mafia, and then we found out about the CIA, and, and um, I spent another year working on the CIA, and that's where I ran into Misha's former son-in-law, Robert Corson, and then all the, the connections, uh, when I started looking at Misha, the connections of Misha to the SNL players. Um, and that took me about a year to do. And in the fall of 1989, we were ready to run with the CIA SNL stories. And Walter Mischer, of course, was the center, in the center of it. And, and his, his story, the story about him, was scheduled to lead it off. I mean, because he's the glue that holds all this together. And it's very difficult to understand the story without Walter Mischer. Now, there may be somebody above Mischer telling him what to do. And I was told by a couple of people in Houston that there is indeed. But I was never able to identify that person if indeed that person exists. But Misher was, is the key middleman, and the key broker of all the deals. And without him, it's very difficult to understand these stories. The stories were scheduled to run in the, in the, the winter of 1989. Uh, we sent them over to the Houston Post law firm, Fulbright and Jaworski, to read for libel. They sort of read all the stories for libel and try to give us advice. Uh, usually uh, they, they, they had the authority, although they shouldn't have, uh, to kill stories that they thought might get us in, into libel trouble. Well, Fulbright and Jaworski went through the ceiling on Misher. They immediately reacted and said, we can't run this stuff, and gave a lot of bogus reasons for not doing so. So we began in, in the uh, in, in February of 1990 to run the CIA stories, but nothing on Misher. We had Corson, we had uh, a Kansas City guy named Farhad Azima. Uh, we had a little savings and loan in Lano called Peoples that was, was lending money to CIA people in Florida. Uh, we had Silverado Savings and, and San Jacinto. We ran all these, these stories, but nothing on Misher. And um, we ran out of stories eventually in the, in the summer of 1990. It must have been difficult to write your story with the main actor not being able Very to... Very difficult. <laughs> and, and most of the national media reacted negatively. I mean, they, they did not pick up the story. Um, they said, you know, they, it was too hard to understand and a lot of other reasons. But I think, and also the Houston Post is to blame for, for one thing, for not running a big series. They would just have one story and wait several weeks and run another one and wait. And I think it's just because they were afraid of the story. You know, they were afraid, you know, they just kind of wanted to stick their little foot in the water and, and see if it got bit off and, and then run another one if it didn't. And uh, so they were, they were released sporadically and uh, there was no mystery in it. So a lot of the, the national media did not pick up. I don't know if we'd run them as a series and had mystery whether the, they'd have had any more impact. It's difficult to tell. Yeah. The national media really... Uh, uh, handles the CIA with kid gloves. And we can talk about that later, <laughs> why, if you'd like to. But anyway, um, we'd run out of stories, so we, I went back to the Misher stuff, and I tried to get that in again. 
and uh, the editors signed off on it. They approved it. I thought I'd met all of Fulbright and Jaworski's objections, and they were scheduled to run in the last of December of 1990. And then at the very last moment, uh, Fulbright and Jaworski refused to sign off on the stories. The editors, even though the city editor uh, wanted to run them and, and really recommended running them over Fulbright and Jaworski's uh, objections, the editor-in-chief decided uh, not to do it, not to do the Misher stories. Now, during this period, I was talking, I was at my folks' ranch. Uh, it was Christmas time. I was talking to the city editor and uh, the Fulbright and Jaworski associate that was handling the Misher stuff, a guy named Tom Godbold. And I was talking on the phone with the city editor and said, Godbold won't sign off on him. And, and I, was, I was furious. And I said, you know, his job's probably on the line. I bet he won't get made partner if he doesn't kill these stories. You know, I was just, just talking. I was mad. Well, six weeks later, I'd taken a leave of absence to write, work on the book, and I had lunch with the city editor. And he looked at me and he said, guess what? Godbold just got made partner. And that's so a Fulbright that, and <coughs> Jaworski. So that's when I started looking for conflicts of interest. Now, a year and a half earlier, when Godbold was objecting to all the Misher stuff, I directly asked him, do you have any, does Fulbright and Jaworski have any conflicts of interest with these stories? And he said, not that I know of. Okay, when I, I found close to a dozen conflicts of interest, including the fact that Fulbright and Jaworski was representing Misher's company in a wrongful death lawsuit. At the same time, they were telling us we couldn't run these stories about Walter Misher. In addition, they were also doing other things for Misher, as well as doing legal things for Palmer National Bank, this bank in Washington, D.C. Uh, they had represented Howard Pulver's company in, a, in an insurance deal and on, and they, they had laundered money uh, for, a, uh, for the CIA, basically, through the MD Anderson Foundation, uh, and conflict after conflict I dug up on Fulbright and Jaworski. Now, I went to the Houston Post, I told them about these conflicts, and the Houston Post did nothing. And so I knew that, that, that I could not go to back, back to work for the Houston Post if I'm going to have to run everything through Fulbright and Jaworski, who was ser serving as the ultimate editors on all these stories. So was it at this time you decided to go the book route that you'd resign from the Houston Post and try to write this up as a uh, book? Well, actually, uh, it happened earlier. During the middle of the stories I was writing for the, uh, for the Post in the summer of 1990, Simon & Schuster came to me, actually approached me, with an idea of writing a book for them. Uh, Simon Schuster is either the first or second largest publishing company, uh, country in this uh, company in this country, and uh, very prestigious. And they flew me up to New York City and rolled out the red carpet, and made me a very big offer to write the book for them. Hundred thousand, hundred thousand yeah. dollar advance, which is probably bigger than any advance on a savings and loan book that has been been written. And uh, so we began negotiating a contract, and I was insistent in the beginning, at the very beginning, that the book be published before the 1992 presidential election. I mean, this is in, by the way, the summer of 1990. And uh, because, not only because of what I'd found on George Bush, but what I'd found on Lloyd Benson. And at that time, it certainly wasn't beyond the realm of possibility that the 92 election was going to be Bush versus Benson. And in fact, if you recall, when Clinton had all the trouble in earlier this year, with in, in January and February, with Jennifer Flowers and the draft, he said that if he dropped out, he was going to throw his support behind Lloyd Benson. And now we have Benson being the leading candidate for the Secretary of Treasury. Okay, so I was pushing very hard, and, and uh, Fulbright and Jaworski actually modified their standard contract to shorten the time between acceptance and publication. You mean Simon and Schuster? Simon and Schuster, I'm sorry. To, to shorten the time between uh, acceptance and publication. And I eventually signed a contract with them. And, and when I took a leave of absence from the Post to write the book, I submitted the book on deadline. And uh, I, I got back an editing letter a couple of months after that that told me that something wasn't exactly right here because they wrote me a four-page letter that was just full of vague nonsense. I mean, it was not helpful at all. And uh, when I had submitted the manuscript on deadline, I, I again put in writing 
that the book had to be published before the 1992 election in writing. Um, so we began the editing process, and uh, I tried to accommodate their suggestions, and I really couldn't. I made some alternative suggestions. They okayed it. I submitted a revised manuscript in February uh, of this year, 92. And uh, after they got the revised manuscript, but before they'd even read it, they really cut me off. They would not return my phone calls, my faxes, my letters, nothing. Um, and so I was fairly desperate at that time, um, and I knew that they had what they call their fall list, the list of all the books they publish in the latter part of the year. And I knew that my book had to be on there to get out before the election. And so when they wouldn't return my phone calls or talk to me, I eventually made an appointment just to fly out to New York City and see them. And at that, it was only at that time that, that, they, that they returned my phone call. And I, I told the editor, who was Alice Mayhew, who was Bob Woodward's editor, a very famous editor, you know, that the book needed to go before the election and we needed to get going. And she said she wasn't going to do it. They were not going to do the book before the election. And I said, why not? You know, all this stuff about Bush, the American public needs to know. And she said, quote, George Bush is going to win anyway. And of course, she turned out to be wrong, but even so, I, that struck me as nonsense. I mean, what difference does that make about getting, I mean, getting the information before the public? And, and what, how does she know that what's going to happen in, uh, it was, I guess, in 10 months <coughs> or so? Why, why do you think uh, Simon and Schuster refused to publish the book before the election? It was ready to go, right? Well, as, uh, it was basically ready, and, it, and if they'd wanted to, they could have. I mean, it was not, I mean, Simon and Schuster is a very big company. I mean, I g eventually got the book published before the election with a small company. I mean, they could have put two editors on it, and we could have done it. Mm -hmm. They didn't. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't want to speculate on their motives, but there's some interesting connections. In fact, I knew this going in. I knew about the connections between Simon and & Schuster and George Bush and the Houston Power Brokers. Oh, what is that? Well, um, one of George Bush's best friends and, and longtime business associates, Hugh Ledke, chairman of the board of Pennzoil, is on the board of directors of Simon & Schuster's parent corporation, Paramount Communications. And uh, Hugh Ledke is actually in my book in regard to a, a very strange bank in Houston that he was on the board of. Also, Paramount Communications used to be a, the, is the uh, successor company to Gulf and Western, uh, the conglomerate that were, one of the founding fathers is John Duncan of Houston, whose brother Charles was Secretary of Energy under the Carter administration. And these people are in investments with uh, people who connect to uh, Walter Misher. And, and back to George Bush. And so I knew this going in. I just thought it'd be poetic justice for Simon & Schuster to publish this book, you know. Uh, but apparently they knew about it too, I guess. I mean, uh, <clears throat> Pete, you've been, you've been dealing with some uh, pretty unsavory and dangerous characters here, the CIA and the Mafia. Have you had any threats in your life, or have you been fearful of it? Well, I, I, not that I know of. I mean, I'm kind of slow. Maybe I got threatened and I didn't realize it, but uh, nothing directly. Uh, I mean, th these people usually leave reporters, and they don't, you know, threaten reporters. I mean, they may try to keep the book from being published. Or they might threaten you with, a, I mean, I've been threatened with lawsuits. Oh. I mean, they, they will do that, but not physically threatened. And, you know, they, the way they operate is to keep people like Simon Schuster from publishing the book, or keep anybody from publishing, or keeping it from being distributed. Um, and so, you know, they work indirectly, not, not, I mean, if anything happened to me, that would just bring more publicity on this, and which is the last thing they want. I mean, the, the way they're reacting to the book is that, they're really sort of kind of hunkering down and ignoring it and figuring that any publicity will, will, will vanish eventually and disappear. Have you been contacted by Larry King yet or any of the no, talk I mean, shows? No, the, the national media has shown no interest in this. The, the one exception is the Village Voice that published an excellent uh, article on your book and on your research by uh, Jonathan uh, Quitney, who's also an investigative reporter of some um, renown. Right, that happened uh, when Simon & Schuster told me they were not going to publish before the election. 
uh, I contacted Quitney. I had been in touch with John Quitney because he'd written a number of books on the on the mafia and the CIA. And uh, you know, I wanted to sort of do a reality check and send the manuscript to Quitney and ask him whether he thought it should be published before the election, just to make sure that I wasn't hallucinating. Maybe Simon Schuster was right. And so I sent the manuscript to Quitney, and he read it and agreed with me that it should be published before the election. And uh, he was helping me, you know, get the information out and, and actually was, was, had gone to a number of different publications to try to do, you know, a, a serialization of the book, and eventually the Village Voice did it, but just barely before the election. And even though the book was printed four weeks before the election, uh, it really didn't get out. I mean, it should have been out in the summer. You know, I really apologize. I, I did everything that I knew how. And, and if so, you told somebody in, say, May of this year that you could get a book published in five months, they would have laughed at you. So it was not possible. Well. We did it, but just barely. Pete, let's uh, talk a little bit about the sort of final uh, response of your work by the establishment, by journalists, uh, Congress, and then possibly the uh, public, and how you, you reacted to the sort of non-response of the sort of journalist establishment and then the Congress. You yourself was a, were a reporter for the Human Houston Post. You published these articles about the CIA and the SNLs that were explosive investigative reporting and they just weren't picked up by the national uh, media. What did this lead you to conclude towards the press in the United States? Well, did this change your attitude in any way? Well, I mean, uh, some of the press picked up the stories. Um, but the, the television networks and the big three, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, never did anything. And I personally think the reason they didn't was because it wasn't their story, okay? And they liked to do their own investigative work. And they were very far behind. It would have been impossible for them to do the work it would take to do these stories in a, in, a, in a manner that would, you know, that would be a good job. And these these institutions had not even done the SNL stories right. right. I mean, they had ignored, basically ignored them, done a little bit, but it was all the, they were just recycling uh, the work that had basically been done by the Dallas Morning News and Byron Harris and WFAA in Dallas, which was to write about all the Wheeler Dealer, Don Dixon, Ed McBurney types. And that began to be sort of the pattern of investigative reporting. If you did investigative reporting on SNLs, you wrote about all the wild and crazy guys down in Texas that were looting this, these SNLs, and you didn't do what you should have done, which was follow the money. I mean, that's the big advice, you know, Deep Throat gave Bob Woodward in Watergate. Follow the money. That's where the, that's where the story is. Well, that's where the story is in the SNLs, but the reporters did not do that. It was right about the front man and the wild and crazy guys. So these institutions did not do a very good job on the SNLs. So they didn't have the foundation to do either the mafia or the CIA involvement. So, you know, if, if you don't do something, they're, they're the kind of, of, of institutions and people that just ignore it, you know. It's not our story. It's not worth doing. We're just going to ignore it, you know. If we didn't do it, it must not be worth anything. So that, that's exactly what happened. Now, what about uh, Congress? When you first made these revelations that the CIA was involved in robbing the CIA of the savings and loan and using the money to help support the Contras and other illegal off-the-book operations, Congress made some noise that they were going to do some investigation. What came out of this? Well, uh, actually, the, uh, the House Permanent Subcommittee uh, on Intelligence, which uh, has oversight of the CIA, uh, did a, a preliminary investigation by their staff and eventually came up and said there's nothing to this. Uh, but it's interest there are several interesting points to note. Number one, uh, they never did what they should have done, which was track any of the money. They relied on the CIA for all their information. And um, even the CIA admitted that of the, like, the 20 institutions we named uh, that they had dealt with uh, four of them and that they had dealt with five of the individuals 
we had known him. But they had done nothing wrong. And the thing is that the staff director of the House Intelligence Committee, who was overseeing the investigation, a guy named Dan Childs, had come from the C. He was the, the chief financial officer of the CIA and had been brought over to the intelligence uh, subcommittee right before my stories came out. And the CIA, of course, was aware. I mean, I had ta been talking to them for months, so they knew that my stories were going to break soon. Dan Childs also had been brought in 10 years earlier in the Senate uh, Intelligence uh, Committee that had been doing the church investigation that was exposing all the illegal domestic activities of the CIA. Childs had been brought in for damage control. It certainly looked like he was being brought in for damage control. And in fact, after they released their report saying there was nothing to this, Childs went back to the CIA. Now he's the executive assistant to the CIA director. This is shameless. It's like uh, this guy Polgar, who was put in charge of investigating Iran Contra, who was another lifetime CIA operative station chief of about six different places, as you point out in your uh, book. So basically, Congress didn't do anything. No. They covered it up. The press really didn't do anything. And now the Clinton administration faces as much as a $500 billion price tag for the CIA uh, scandal. So what can the government finally do about this? Congress and the Justice Department can track the money. That's all they have to do. And if there was fraud involved, they can get it back. And they haven't done this. I mean, everybody's acting like it's a foregone conclusion that we've lost $500 billion. You know, okay, taxpayers, take the hit and go on. It's not true. The Justice Department is very capable of tracking this money. They can track drug money. It starts out as cash in the United States, goes offshore, and comes back. Surely they can track SNL money. That's always a paper or wire transfer. It's easy to track if, if you got subpoena power. Congress could do it, but they're not doing it. And I don't know whether Clinton is going to make the Justice Department do this or not. Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see who the new Attorney General is going to be and whether they're going to go out. I mean, I don't see any indication on Clinton's part that he has any interest in, in, in kicking the sleeping dog. And I think he just wants to let it lie and uh, not mess with it because his party is just as involved as the, uh, as the Republicans. And uh, so I don't see, uh, there's going to have to take, just be mass revolt by the American people and the American people don't have the information. So what is the responsibility of the uh, press and the citizens to do something about this SNL scandal? Well, I mean, the press has got to do the reporting and the citizens have to do the complaining. You're watching Alternative Views. We turn now to some news stories from the Alternative Press. World Press Review has some the stories, some opinions of various newspapers are around the world. Uh, most of the quotes are, um, oh, not all that significant. But there are a couple of them that I thought you might be interested in. One from a Munich Independent newspaper says it's difficult to discern a program or policy in the new president's uh, persona. He succeeded in pleasing everyone and antagonizing no one and it was a very perfect marketing strategy. So their conclusion was that Clinton was not elected, Bush was summarily fired. And in Tehran, they said that our experience with the USA during the past half century has left us with no illusions about either Republicans or Democrats. A desire for hegemony is so deep-rooted in the psyche of the American political establishment that the new president, even though he's a Democrat, has no choice but to tread the path of norm in traditional USA foreign policy. One of Bill Clinton's chief campaign pledges was to limit the influence of lobbyists in Washington, D.C. Well, the New York Times News Service reports that his transition team has extensive industry and ties and ties to foreign countries. For instance, Vernon Jordan, the transition chairman earns at least $442,000 a year from, in fees from sitting on the boards of 11 corporate giants, including Union Carbide, American Express, Xerox, and the debt-laden RJR Nabisco. Jordan also holds almost a million dollars worth of stock in these companies. 
In his law firm, Aiken, Gump, Hauer, and Feld represents at least seven of these corporations as well, and as a senior partner, he shares in the law firm's part, uh, profits. The transition director, working right under Jordan, Warren Christopher, is the senior partner in one of the nation's largest law firms, O'Melveny and Myers, whose clients include Mitsui, Sumitomo Trust and Banking, Japan Airlines, and Hyundai. And during the campaign, Clinton made a point of criticizing lobbyists who work for foreign interests, but the Japanese interests, at least, are well represented in his uh, transition team. As well, Christopher earned at least $73,000 last year from sitting on the boards of Lockheed Corporation and Southern California Edison, and his firm also represents both corporations. So you can imagine what sort of feelings this person is going to have about regulating utilities and also military cutbacks. Also, uh, Mickey Cantor, another board member on the transition team, is a member of Manet Phelps, Phillips and Cantor, which has done work for the government, done work for the governments of Cyprus and Jamaica, and for a wide array of for-profit healthcare corporations, real estate, and transportation firms. He also does lobbying for Japan's NEC Corporation, the cable television industry, and a number of big oil companies. He also uh, on the side, conducted a policy brief briefing for a number of his clients and potential clients, including General Electric. Uh, Samuel Berger, another member, the transition team's foreign policy director, also has for years presided over an international trade firm, uh, pra the international trade practice at Hogan and Hartson, a law firm whose clients have included Poland, Czechoslovakia, the Bahamas, Ontario, Japan again, and the trading arm of China as well as the Toshiba Corporation of J Japan. And when Toshiba got in trouble with the U.S. government for exporting a sensitive technology to the, Soviet the former Soviet Union, Berger was there in Washington helping to defend Toshiba's interests. As Ralph Nader, Nader put it, Cesar Chavez isn't getting any calls, and there have been widespread complaints from the coalition that elected Clinton, which includes uh, many civil rights leaders, uh, people working for migrant farmers, people working for other minority rights, that people from these uh, institutions just haven't been called upon. Clinton's gone for the traditional lobbyists and lawyers who have always been sitting inside the beltway dictating what's done to the congressman. I think it's very significant that, uh, what was that, from the New York Times, Washington Post? New York Times News uh -huh. Service. Right. See, they're not going to point out other connections and interconnections uh, with Clinton and the staff that he's putting together. Uh, for instance, um, I look at the sociology of leadership. What organizations do these people come from? And who are the other people uh, that they associate with? Well, Bill Clinton was a member of the Bilderberger that secret organization, as well as the Council on Foreign Relations. Vernon Jordan is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. Warren Christopher is a member of all three of those elite organizations. Uh, Henry, little Henry Cisneros is a member of the CFR. And, of course, Lloyd Benson, uh, the, who they say are going to be our new uh, Secretary of Treasury, he uh, w is, uh, attended Bilderberg meetings uh, recently as well. So the people that Clinton has in his... Uh, transition team are people from this very small group of elite organizations and very few people are members of these organizations Council on Foreign Relations only has about 15 to 1700 but the number of people in government from these organizations is huge compared to their size so we're seeing the same type of thing that we did before in the um, in actually in the in the Bush and Reagan years, they came from these organizations. Well, the Carter people too. And the Carter, so it's just basically Carter, um, Carter re revisited. Except Clinton is more conservative than Carter, and Clinton came from the uh, the uh, Democratic Leadership Council, which was a rebellion against uh, the liberal hegemony of the Democrats. And I saw a statistic where it said that the uh, Congress people who also are the, uh, support the Democratic Leadership Council, they voted with the Reagan-Bush years. They voted for Reagan and Bush 80 to 90 percent of the time. So it's questionable as how much change Bill Clinton wants or how much he can achieve even if he wants it.
So this, I think, is a major indication that at least when it comes to economics, it's going to be uh, business as usual with the Clinton administration. My guess is that Clinton's going to continue the conservative policies of the previous decade in the area of economics and foreign policy, and he'll have a much more liberal agenda on social issues. World Press Review has a couple of articles about the Mafia, which are really quite disturbing. It says that the Mafia, like the rest of the economy in the 80s, has gone global, global and has forged alliances wherever it's needed to, killed wherever it's needed to, and is sponsoring indigenous crime syndicates under its control in a lot of countries where they weren't operating before, particularly, uh, say, in Eastern Europe. It has uh, managed to uh, come to grips and work out relationships with the Turkish heroin bosses, the <coughs> Colombia drug cartels. So internationally, it's, sp it's stronger than it ever has been. And even, you know, you hear references here and there to the Russian mafia taking over so much of what is happening and the chaos in, um, in Russia right now. Well, that mafia is actually connected with the uh, Italian Sicilian Mafia. Things have changed a bit though in that the Mafia still kills in Italy, they've seen that. However, they've kind of gone along with the Colombian style of killing now. They use, instead of just uh, very clean assassinations with uh, rifles or so, there are so were some machine guns. They're doing it now with car bombs, which actually kills some uh, a lot of civilians as well. As an indication of the strength and internationalization of the mafia, on St. Valentine's Day, appropriately enough, in 1989, there was a meeting in Nice of members of the international uh, consortium of uh, illegals, the Sicilian mafia, which is the octopus, the giant mafia. Uh, they also, uh, with representatives of the Colombian and Venezuelan cartels, well, they all got together so that they could divide up the world's spoils, uh, so that they wouldn't have competition with each other, they wouldn't be trampling on each other, or, or they wouldn't have to be killing each other. Cartelization of uh, crime around the world. And what's happening in Italy? There have been some uh, well-publicized assassinations uh, recently, and the people have uh, had a lot of outcry against uh, the uh, Mafia. But this has been going on for some time. Uh, there will be assassinations, the people come up in arms, there will be investigations, and the government say, well, we're going to do something about it, but then nothing ever gets done. It's business as usual. And that is because, according to the World Press Review articles, the establishment in Italy is right in bed, has a very cozy working relationship with the mafia, and so they're not doing anything about it. So they're becoming stronger and stronger all around the world. It's ironic, this parallel development with international capital and the Mafia keeps lockstep right along with it. Well, according to the New York Times, a rising cost of modernity is depression. If the 20th century ushered in the age of anxiety, its exit, according to the Times, is witnessing the dawn of the age of melancholy. The first international study of major depression reveals a steady rise in the disorder worldwide. The nations as diverse as the United States, Taiwan, Lebanon, and New Zealand, in these countries in each generation, the possibility of getting serious depression, not just sadness, but a paralyzing listlessness, dejection, self-depreciation, and overwhelming sense of hopelessness that these days, it's three times likelier that you're going to get this depression that's going to set in than your grandparents. There's been a lot of speculation of why melancholy is on the rise. Some speculate that loss in a belief of God takes away a buffer against life's uh, setbacks. Others say the distress created in women by the spread of unattainable ideals of female beauty is a cause, whereas others say that it's physiological, that it has to do more with exposure to toxic substances. And there's been a big debate over why younger Americans also 
in uh, recent years have had a much, much higher um, case of uh, melancholy than the uh, former uh, generation. Recent studies in journals in the United States indicate that there's a, a much, much higher proportion of people that are getting, getting melancholy these days, and it's become a modern epidemic. I have a couple of short articles here on Poland, one from the World Press Review of, let's see, where does it have, December 1992. And the other from Dollars and Cents, uh, where's that from? De also December 1992. The uh, World Press Review says that the Polish government foresees five more years of recession before things start uh, becoming a little bit better for the people in Poland. And it seems that even that five years taking of that long was a compromise between the reformists and the uh, people who uh, want to go a little bit slower and ease the pain. But according to dollars and cents, it's ironic that the people who are supposedly uh, foisting this on the people, all this pain, are the people who actually used to come from the labor ranks. Remember, Lech Walesa was the leader of the Labor Union Solidarity. Now, the, uh, in the summer of 92, a group of unions that had spearheaded Solidarity are now going out on wildcat strikes against Solidarity and the uh, Walesa, Walesa leadership. But there's a very interesting quote by the Prime Minister, who, uh, when some the workers started striking, she sent out uh, dismissal notices to them. They just kick them out, and so the leaders of the strike immediately scaled back their wage demands. Well, the woman who was the prime minister uh, came from a satellite party of the communists originally back in 1984, and she was expelled from the party for voting against taking away Solidarity's legal status. But she's changed her mind now. Here's what she says about the workers. For 40 years, the workers were treated as the most important class on which the whole system of the state stood. And it's very bitter for them to understand that the new conditions require them to step down to a very low status. And that brings us to the end of this Alternative Views. Frequently hear from viewers who request a list of news publications which we use on Alternative Views and also a reading list for U.S. power structure in the mass media. If you would like to have these, send a stamped, self-addressed envelope to the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. You must send a self-addressed stamped envelope. We'd like to extend our thanks to a lot of people who helped make the program possible, particularly Pete Bruton, who wrote the incredible book, The Mafia, the CIA, and George Bush. Our crew for the interview consisted of Brian Lynch, Ashley Blake, Mary McDonald, and Dina Craven. For our news section, Eric Eubank was on camera. Kevin L. West did the audio. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye.